All right, we're back, and we're going to talk about cognitive development in this segment. And it's good to be forewarned that cognitive development is sort of a long segment. Social development will be too, just full honesty. <laughs> Motor development was brief. All right, so cognitive development. We're going to start off by talking about Jean Piaget, who was a Swiss psychologist. In Switzerland, they have French, German, and Italian as their number language. Um, they're all accepted languages. So Jean Piaget was a French-speaking Swiss scientist. Um, he was a scientist from the time he was really little. He wrote a paper on having discovered a, a, an albino sparrow when he was like six years old. So he was, he's been a scientist his whole life. Um, and, he, and one of the things, if you remember from chapter one, we talked about the, the attitudes that a scientist carries. Um, one of them is curiosity. And he displayed that kind of curiosity from the time he was little and found a white bird to when he was an adult and he had children. And so a lot of these theories that he developed about child cognitive development were based on his observations of his own children. And then he expanded out and tested other children and expanded his theory to encompass more children. I'm going to tell you his theory and what, how he accounts for development across um, your childhood, and then uh, I'll tell you about some of the criticisms of Piaget's model. All right. First off, he says that our biological development drives our intellectual development. So one of the things he thought was really important for all of us to remember is that we can't accelerate our children's development through the stages. We have to wait until they are biologically ready to move to the next stage, or else it's just going to frustrate, you know, you and your offspring. It's just not going to be a, a good thing. There's no. He really thought there was no point in trying to accelerate cognitive development. They're not going to make that next leap until they're biologically ready. And, and when he meant bio, biological, he was referring to the brain development. Um, now that doesn't mean again, that we should be putting our children in closets till they're five or something, ignoring them because it's hopeless until they biologically develop. He said experience with the environment was key for children to start making that leap and that experience helps to drive development. Um, so biology underpins cognition, but um, experience helps to drive that biology to move, to move forward, to make those connections in the brain and move forward. So here are some examples of how important errors are in development. He thought trial and error learning was really important for children. So he, I've got some pictures here of a, a, a little child trying to slide down the, the toy slide, um, or again, another one where I don't understand I'm too big. Um, these kind of errors are very informative. When you realize that, you know, just because the little toy can slide down the slide doesn't mean everything can slide down the slide, right? Um, just because the little, you know, figurine can drive in the car doesn't mean I can drive in the car. These are big important things for babies to find out. They have to they have to try it out. So errors, he thought, were super important in shaping um, children's cognitive development. I think it's probably important for all of us. I mean, I always remember much more um, vividly the things that I did wrong and got feedback that I was incorrect about than the things that I was right about. Um, so Errors are always important, but he thought critical for children. So what he was arguing is we need to give children the room to make mistakes and learn things. So he developed a stages of development model where he thought that as we biologically uh, mature through different ages, we will gain different cognitive skills. That's the basic idea. Now, he has ranges of age because he recognizes we don't all biologically develop at the same time. Um, but, well, let's just get in. I won't make any more excuses for him. Okay. So let's start with the first stage. Between birth and two years of age, he said that uh, babies are in what he called the sensory motor stage. Um, basically, they understand the world through their senses and through their movements through the world right, through sensory, sensory, right, that's the senses, motor movements. So as babies are grasping or crawling or doing the things that babies do, mouthing, those kinds of things, they're exploring the world and coming to understand it better. Big things that are going to happen during these two years that are going to be developmental milestones that will help to push the baby into the next stage are object permanence, and stranger anxiety. Um, in object permanence, do I have a picture? I have a video that I won't be able to run because it's copyrighted on YouTube. So 
if you want to find this video. I'll link, I'll link it in my classroom for my students. If you're not one of my students, you can always just Google this by its title. Um, they take an object that the baby's very interested in, put it under that pillow, and as far as this baby is concerned, <laughs> it's disappeared. It's gone. Um, when babies are about, you know, this baby's probably about six months old because he can sit up, he or she can sit up unsupported, but doesn't have object permanence yet. As soon as that object is out of sight, it's out of existence as far as the baby's concerned. By about eight months old, most babies will start to recognize that if I watched you put it under the pillow, all I have to do is move the pillow and I'll see the thing again. So they're starting to get partial um, object permanence, but something that's kind of fun to do with babies at that age is to do what's called the A not B error, which is where now you have two pillows. You place the desired object, the little doll or whatever, under one of the pillows under watch with the baby fully watching. So you go, look, baby, here's the little toy you like, and you stick it underneath one of the pillows. And then the baby removes the pillow and takes the toy. And you do it again. Oh, look, here goes the little baby under the pillow. Okay, here you go. And the baby pulls the pillow away, and there's their toy. On the next trial, you go, here, baby, here's the toy, and you stick it under the other pillow. Here's how you'll know if the baby doesn't have full object permanence yet. If they remove that first pillow that does not contain the doll, but is the one that they've been removing for the previous two trials, if they remove it first before looking under the second pillow, you know the baby does not have full object permanence yet. They almost act as if they believe that the act of moving that pillow, that first pillow is what reconjures the object, like the superstitious kind of behavior. So they have to do it. And sometimes they, they have to do it so profoundly that they will actually be looking at the pillow that contains the object as they're moving the other pillow. Like they know they have to move that first pillow before they can move the second one because the thing won't really reappear unless I move that first pillow. That's clearly a baby who does not have full object permanence yet. Sometime around 12 months old, most babies have got complete object permanence. And, and you can tell because you can hide stuff when they're not even looking and say, hey, where are your shoes? And they'll go look for them. They know the shoes still exist and they'll go search for them. They may not be very good searchers, but they know the shoes still exist and so they'll go through the process of searching. Um, the stranger anxiety issue I already talked about in chapter two as being possibly adaptive, but about nine to 13 months, most babies go through a period where they suddenly recognize that some people are part of my family and I trust and other people are strangers and I don't trust them. Um, and they may shy away, they may hide behind their parents and other cues that they are anxious when they're around strangers. That's a sign that they've started to develop that cognitive awareness of, you know, friend versus foe or um, known versus unknown and those kinds of things. So that's a big developmental milestone. Between two and seven years of age, we get some really fun errors going on. This is the pre-operational stage. That means that they don't yet understand how the world operates, right? They are pre, not yet, operational, how the world operates. So they don't quite get it. They, they know just enough to get it wrong, really. So big things that happen during the stage, you can tell that they're in the stage because they're using words. Actually, that's the, the end of infancy is when babies start to speak words. So that tends to move you to the pre-operational stage. They use images to represent things. They'll start to rec recognize grandma and grandpa in a photograph or their dog or a dog in the, in the photograph. Um, so they're starting to recognize that a photograph can represent a real world person or object, things like that. But the errors come from the fact that they use their intuition. They don't really have any logic yet. Um, so they go a lot with sort of just appearances or how things feel, and they can make some really great errors as a result. Um, we see them being able to pretend play. So they take a you know tablecloth, tie it over their head, and now they are a bride or something like that. Um, it could be completely, they don't, look any, they don't look any more like the thing that they think they are, but they really believe it and they play, pretend play. Um, they might demand that everybody else go along with them. Um, you know, I, I'm Mufasa and you're Simba and, and you're Nala and everybody has to roar at each other. We can't talk anymore, things like that. They make up rules, stuff like that. But the errors. One is egocentrism. And I know we all use the word egocentrism to mean selfishness, right, self-focused. That's not what Piaget meant when describing these preschool kids. What he meant is that they literally think that their perspective on the world is everybody's perspective on the world. And he meant this literally. So, for example, 
whatever I'm seeing, I assume that's what you're seeing also. That's egocentric of me to think that whatever my eyes are collecting is what your eyes are collecting. Whatever I can hear, you can hear, things like that. Now, Piaget tested egocentrism using a three-dimensional model. Um, so you can see an example of one of these three-dimensional models of a mountain. Um, and it's got, you know, little fake trees and little hills. And, and around the model on the four sides, depending on which side you're sitting, you can see a, a deer or you can see a river or a rock, other kinds of things. So the adult sits on one side and the child sits on the other and describes whatever he's seeing, right? Then they move the stool and the child describes whatever he's seeing from another angle. And then they move the stool and he describes whatever he's seeing from the third side. And then finally he goes to the fourth side and describes everything that he sees there. Now we place him on a stool across from us and we say, what am I seeing right now? Now we know that the child has seen the, the mountain from all four sides. And we know that he knows the names of everything and he's seen everything that's there because he's viewed it from all four sides. So if, if we ask him, what are we seeing? Of course, we would expect him to say tree because there's a tree on our side and he's been on our side, right? But he doesn't say, I don't remember, like as if he knows that you're seeing something different than what's in front of him, but he just can't remember the objects. He doesn't say, I don't remember. He starts naming the things that are directly in front of him, what he can currently see. Implying that he assumes that if he can see it, so can you. You're on the opposite side of the table. You can't see those things, but he assumes you must be able to because he can see them. Um, that kind of egocentrism, that idea that my perspective is shared by everybody else is a hallmark of pre-operational reasoning. Um, kids oftentimes will talk too quietly for adults to hear them or um, all sorts of, you know, those kinds of errors. And it's because they, they think if they can hear me, why can't you hear me, right? Um, that's egocentrism. Um, seven to 11 years. Uh, this is called the concrete operational stage because in this period, Piaget says that children can understand how the world operates as long as we're dealing with concrete things, things that can be directly seen, touched, manipulated, something like that. So you're logical as long as they are concrete events. Things that are big hallmarks at this stage is that children can start to recognize analogies. And you say, oh, um, this drink kind of tastes like lemonade, but with like a little hint of peach or something. I don't know what the flavor is. And you're like, oh, that's passion fruit. Okay. But they don't know that. So they give you an analogy. It's like kind of like lemonade that tastes with a little peach, something like that. Um, they start to understand that it, it's sort of like is a verbal way of letting other people know that, you know, I'm trying to describe something to you. They start to be able to do arithmetic because they can start to realize how to com combine numbers together and to form a new number or how to take numbers apart and form a new number. They start to recognize all those kinds of operations. Um, you know you've entered the concrete operational stage when you start to display what Piaget called conservation. Um, conservation in his language meant that you recognize that the, the fundamental properties of an object are maintained even if they appear different. So even though my textbook is actually a rectangle, when I look at it from, a, from the side, it kind of looks like a diamond. I know because I'm through concrete operations that, and I've got conservation, that it's still a rectangle, even though it kind of looks like a diamond now. Um, that kind of conservation. I know that if I pour my water from a big cup into a small cup, it may look like I have less water now, but it's the same amount of water. It, it may look different, but the fundamental volume has stayed the same. Um, so with conservation, we're talking about the child's awareness that the world is stable right, that a ball of Play-Doh that gets smashed into a pancake still contains the same amount of Play-Doh. It just looks different. Um, so once you recognize those things, then you can start being a lot more logical about things in the real world because you start to trust that the world is stable. So these math transformations and things like that are all really critical to um, concrete operational stage thinking. Ah, in this one I have a 
pre-operational child, this child's between two and seven, being tested for conservation. And um, what they've got is they start off with two rows of five quarters that are all lined up so that they're the same length. And the child acknowledges there's the same number of quarters. And what you're seeing here is that the researcher has spread out one of the lines of quarters so that it's longer. It still, as you know, still contains five quarters, but now it's longer. And so pre-operational children will oftentimes say that the longer row has more quarters, even though the number has not actually changed. A concrete operational child will say it's the same number, you just spread them out. Um, so once you start to re recognize that the world is stable and consistent, then you start to be able to move even into the next stage, which is understanding um, abstract reasoning. This last stage, P uh, Piaget called formal operational thinking, because you now finally officially understand how the world works. You know how things operate. So now you can deal with really complex things like abstract questions. Um, you can deal with hypotheticals. What would it mean for you if your mother had never been born? I asked my concrete operational Girl Scouts that question one time when we were doing a, a visit to one of my lifespan development classes. And my students were studying, um, you know, seven to 11 year old kids. My Girl Scouts were um, earning their career badge, so they were there to see me working and then also interviewed the students. And um, so I asked the girls, what would it mean for you if your mother had never been born? And my girls said things like, I would miss her, or then I wouldn't know my uncle, who I guess is their mom's brother. Um, one said, then my parents wouldn't be fighting as much. I had one kid who actually was tested in the gifted program, and this may be part of what makes a person gifted is a, a little cognitively ahead of other kids. She said, I don't think I'd be alive if my mom hadn't been born, but she wasn't confident. <laughs> She's like, I think that would mean I wasn't alive. And uh, even the one who you know thought kind of close, she wasn't completely sure. Uh, person who is in formal operations will absolutely go, well, if my mom hadn't been born, I wouldn't be here. Like, what are you talking about? Um, once you get to that ability to deal with those kinds of abstractions, those hypotheticals, you know that you're into formal operations. Piaget thought that once you got to puberty, you entered this more adult way of looking at the world. As people who have all passed through puberty and beyond, I think we can all agree that we did not fully mature in our thinking just because we passed through puberty. Um, there was some more development to go on as far as a, our, our formal operation reasoning. Um, and our mature moral reasoning doesn't really mature at puberty, that there's a lot more development to go on. So it's a good time to mention some of the criticisms of Piaget's theory. Um, for one thing, some researchers think that he underestimates the skill sets of the birth to two-year-olds because he didn't have any of the more advanced methods that we have today for testing what a baby knows. And so he may have been underestimating what a baby can do. And most researchers agree that he overestimated what an adolescent can do. You know, somebody who's reached puberty but hasn't fully matured, um, that he was probably overestimating that. In fact, they've done research on college students and they found that the average college student, who typically is somebody between 18 and 22 years of age, the average college student was still in co concrete operational thinking. Um, so his idea that at puberty we were ready for concrete op for formal operational reasoning is probably a little optimistic. We probably are starting it and that we make little inroads into it and, and things. But um, abstractions are difficult probably until, you know, full adulthood. So um, his theory is not without critics, that's for sure. But he definitely set up an idea for how we progress through um, the cognitive stages. All right. So that was, that was Piaget. One of the things that Piaget introduced was this concept of a schema. Schemas are mental frameworks for organizing experience, and they're based on our experiences. You're not born with intact schemas. You develop them based on your experience in the world. And so my schemas are different from your schemas who are different from your neighbor's schemas, right? Like we all have our own schemas of how the world works. Um, so I thought I'd illustrate with a really lame, small schema. 
the concept of office, like what's an office. And when I was creating my little smart art here, I put office in the middle, and I just started listing things that are in offices, right? A desk, a phone, a chair, a typewriter, and bookshelves. Okay. The fact that this is what I typed without thinking or putting too much effort into it kind of implies this is my expectation based on long experience, not necessarily what's in my office, right, or what I need in an office or something like that. Um, as we go through life, we assimilate new information into our schema without necessarily changing our existing schema. So did you notice something that's missing off of my schema that clearly must be in my office because I'm currently using it to talk to you guys? <laughs> Where's the computer? Why did I write typewriter? What the heck? Why is typewriter on there? Maybe my brain was thinking, basically something you type with, and I wrote the old word for it rather than computer, I'm not sure. But here's the thing. I think what it means is that this is my schema for office, and when I don't think and I just type it out and it just comes out my fingers without a ton of conscious, you know, editing, that I type what I really think a scheme, you know, a, an office is. And really, I've just assimilated computer into the office. It's not really in tech. It hasn't really changed my, my schema, I don't think. I don't think so. I mean, I'm working on a computer right now, and I'm in what is one of my offices because this is I'm actually at home in my home office. And at work, I use this same computer. The fact that it moves around, I think it doesn't really fit into my office schema. It's I use it in the living room most of the time, so I think I might have just like not that tight of an association between computer and office. I just assimilated it into my schema for office. It isn't really. I haven't changed my schema. I've just kind of addended thing that you type with, now it's called a computer. It's not called a typewriter anymore. Of course, I do a lot of other things with a computer besides type. For example, record lectures or compute statistics or other things. But I largely kind of think of it as analogous to a typewriter. And so I think I haven't really formally changed my schema. I've just assimilated computer into, the, into my schema. You guys probably have an entirely different schema than I do. If I were to have accommodated it, I would not have made the, I wouldn't have written the word typewriter. I would have just written computer. I would have actually adjusted my schema to accurately represent that computers belong in offices, not typewriters, right? Like I wouldn't have even thought of a typewriter probably. I would have said computer. That's what I work with. I'm surprised I wrote down phone. I never even talk on the phone in my office. It has rung like three times in this quarter. And it's like, I must write down phone because that's part of an office, but it's not necessarily my awareness of what phones really are. I do have a phone in my office, but I don't, I don't think a, uh, an office necessarily needs a phone, right? I could function perfectly without a phone. I email with my students all the time. So we can change, like physically change the organization of our schema through accommodation. Um, assimilation, we just sort of make an addendum. We don't really change the schema. So I think for me, computer is really just assimilated in. Um, I'm perplexed by why it's not been accommodated in. But part of the reason why it hasn't been accommodated is in order for you to change an existing schema, to actually physically accommodate it and say, okay, my, I really understand the world differently now. I have actually changed my mental framework for experience, you know, organizing experience. In order for you to do that, you have to have like 20 – consistent, contradictory to your existing schema and, you know, supportive of the new thing experiences before you will change your schema. So stereotypes are really hard to break because once we have a, um, included a, a stereotype into our schema, we tend to just assimilate contradictory um, examples of um, you know, members of the group that we have a stereotype about. In class, I ask my students to write down, um, I'm in Washington, and um, especially in the Seattle area, it doesn't seem as, as um, dramatic now that I live, live on the east side of, of Washington, but on the, on the west side, there's um, a pretty active anti-California bias. So I always like to use Californians as the target of our stereotyping. And, you know, sometimes you know, people are too polite. They don't want to say anything negative. But I can usually milk it out and get them to start saying some 
some things they've heard people say about Californians, like they're bad drivers or, um, you know, they're just beach bums or, um, you know, they're, they're superficial or fake, um, you know, a bunch of, you know, I can finally ultimately get them to make a list of things that are characteristics of Californians. And then I tell them, I'm, I'm actually born and raised from California. I moved up here as a, as a young adult. And uh, so what do you do with the fact that we just said a bunch of negative things about Californians and presumably you were liking me up until this point and now I just revealed that I belong to this group that you know has all these um, negative stereotypes about it. What do we do? Typically we'll assimilate. We'll say something like, well, I guess my teacher's just an unusual case of Californians, right? Other Californians are still like that, but, um, you know, my teacher's just a, 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 a you know, special case. And so I can just assimilate the information. I'll have to change my schema. Or we might say something like, see, I knew there was something off about my teacher. I was picking up some kind of weird accent, and, yeah, that explains it. I thought that I thought so. So now we can keep our schema intact because we say, oh, I'm going to change the way that I'm thinking about this teacher. I, did, I, I knew there was something, and now I know what it is. Um, it's very unlikely that a person would say, oh, wow, I thought Californians were all the things that we put on the board, and now I see this person who's not those things. I guess I was wrong. Change my schema. It's not what we usually do. We'd have to meet like 20 consistently people who aren't like our stereotype before we would start to think, I think our stereotype is wrong. And that hardly ever happens. You know, the idea that you would run into 20 consistent Californians behaving differently than you expect without ever having a, an, in, an instance that supports your schema in that whole time, like, that's really unlikely. And so we, we tend to keep our stereotypes because they seem like the best explanation for the things that we experience. And it's one of the things that makes it difficult to get rid of stereotypes and prejudices because, you know, our once we've got our schema set up, we're just so reluctant to actually accommodate and change those schemas. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get to social psychology and how hard it is to change people's attitudes. All right, uh, Kohlberg's moral ladder. Kohlberg was a student of Piaget, and he was really just, he, he agreed with Piaget, the whole biological development and all the stages of development. He believed all that stuff. He wanted to add in some stages of moral development. And by moral, he meant making good decisions, you know, behaving ethically. Not necessarily, you know, a lot of times people hear moral and they think some kind of religion or something. He was just talking about making good decisions that are ethical. So what he thought is that when we're babies, or little, you know, small, we are at what he calls the pre-conventional level. So a convention would be a law or a rule, right, Pre, we don't yet understand the laws and the rules. So kids during this stage of pre-conventional morality behave in a moral way solely because they're trying to avoid punishment or gain some kind of reward. So they share with their sibling not because they recognize that their sibling also wants to play and they're, nice, you know, they're feeling good, happy thoughts. They're doing it because they're like, if I don't share, mommy's going to punish me and I don't want to be punished. Or a flip side, if mommy sees me sharing, she may reward me with something. And so that's why I'm doing what appears to be the right thing. It's not just because they know it's the right thing to do. Once you get to the conventional level, you definitely understand that there are laws and there are rules and that we are supposed to follow the laws and the rules. We may not know why the laws and the rules are there. We may not even understand why we're supposed to follow them. We just know there are laws, there are rules, and we're supposed to follow them. And so during conventional level, um, morality, we follow the laws and the rules just because they are the law or the rule. Again, with my Girl Scouts, I remember when we were, um, you know, starting a new school year, and they must have all moved into conventional level morality because we were saying, okay, so it's the new year, um, you know, what kinds of things do you want to include in our meetings, and what do you want to do? And one of the things that was raised was, let's make a, a poster with all the rules and then we um, can come up with a series of punishments for people who violate the rules. And we're like, wow, that's a pretty dramatic developmental change that you guys have gone through because you guys didn't have rules last year. I mean, they really, they wanted to, they spent two meetings developing their poster of all the rules. It was like, wow, this is okay. Well, I guess it's your troop, but it seems weird to me, but all right. But they're conventional level kids. They wanted to have the rules. And then when somebody would violate the rule, they'd all point at the poster. The good news is this poster thing only lasted for about half the year. And they'd always ask us, you know, are you going to put the poster up? Where's the poster? 
And then slowly they stopped caring about the poster. Um, I think each of them got pointed out once or twice and lost interest in the poster. But they really were just wanting to uphold the rules because it was the rules, not because they thought they were good or it would make our meetings better or anything. They were just doing it because it was the rule. Um, so that, that's very classically conventional level morality. Another aspect of conventional level morality, by the way, is that um, we're worried about um, social rules. So sometimes it's not the overarching it's against the law that will drive us. Sometimes it's my peers will reject me if rules that will really attract our attention. And we see that a lot in the especially younger adolescents um, being a guiding force. The post-conventional level, now we have gone beyond the conventions and we start to realize not all laws are fair, not all laws apply all the time, and we start to say, you know what, I don't care if it's the law, it's not right and it's not fair. So in the post-conventional level, we start to say, you know, we all have rights. Um, we start to realize why a law might be placed. We might say, well, you know, we live in a society, we've all agreed to follow posted speed limits, so I'm supposed to follow the posted speed limits, right? Let's, in fact, let's use speed limits as an example, and we'll walk our way through the moral ladder. Because as adults, we could display reasoning that comes from any of these levels. So let's say that you have recently gotten a speeding ticket. Okay, so now you are out driving, and you know that this you're coming to a part of your drive where sometimes there are officers waiting with speed traps. You can get very pre-conventional after you've had a ticket, and you're like, I am following the speed limit to the T. Everybody else is whizzing past you, and you're like, I don't care. I'm not getting another ticket. And so here you are doing, you know, maybe one over because, you know, you're not that big of a stick in the mud. So you're like, one over, going, I'm not getting another ticket. One more ticket, and I'm going to get a hike in my um, insurance, and I can't afford it. I'm, I get very pre-conventional. Um, don't want to get punished. Um, on the other hand, let's imagine that um, – you haven't had a ticket recently. Let's say instead that you've had a lot of warnings from your boss, but if you're late anymore, they may have to let you go. Well, you may speed because you're more concerned about the punishment that might face you at work for being late than you are concerned about the punishment that is waiting for you on the road. And so you're looking for that gain of, you know, several days of on-time arrival at work so that you can start, you know, getting into your boss's good graces again um, and not as concerned about possibly getting punished on the road. Conventional level morality, there's kind of two layers here. Um, you might have, on one hand, just that respect for the law. And so you are creeping along at 60 while everybody else is whipping past you at 75. And you're like, I don't care. The law says 60. Um, and that would be very conventional level. I'm just following the rule. Um, you might, on the other hand, say, I know the rule is 60, but everybody else thinks I'm like some kind of old grandma. So I'm going to go faster. I don't want these people thinking I'm a snail going too slow so I'm going to go faster than I want to. That would be that conventional level motivation also because I don't want my peers to judge me, even though these are strangers on the highway. I, it still can be, you know, motivating, make us not want to have people think that we are something other than what we are. Post-conventional morality might make you follow the speed limit because you're like, well, these are the posted speeds. I agreed to live in the society. I'm going to follow the speed limit and, and has all to do with rights and responsibilities. Or it might make you say, well, these speed limits were posted assuming certain conditions, and the conditions are really nice right now. It's sunny. It's the perfect time to be driving a little faster. There's no reason why I can't go faster. Those posted speed limits don't always have to apply. Or maybe I've got a sick person in the car, and I'm like, this person's health, getting this person to the hospital is much more important than these posted speed limits. So I'm going to do the right thing for this person's health, which might be the wrong thing in the face of law. Um, but Post-conventional morality could cause us to, to speed also, right? Um, so that's the idea with Kohlberg's moral ladder. A criticism of this um, theory is that he usually gives um, ethical problems to the participants, and how they answer determines um, where they play. So it's not – there aren't right or wrong answers to these questions. It's your reasoning that matters. So he tells basically the plot from Les Miserables, where you know Jean Valjean um, goes to prison and then um, he escapes and he starts a factory someplace in in the country and this tailor recognizes him as the escaped convict and the and the ethical question is should the tailor turn in the factory owner or not and um, 
so you explain your reasoning for why you think he should or shouldn't turn in the um, factory owner, and and then Kohlberg scores your your um, responses. If you say anything that sounds like, well, that something like this happened to a friend of mine, even if you go on to say something very post-conventional about how, you know, it was wrong for him to go to prison in the first place for just stealing bread and medicine, or if you, even if you say something more post-conventional in the long run, as soon as you mention friend or family member or something like that, the scoring says you're placed in the conventional level because you're concerned about peers or um, others. And that, cause, that causes a lot of women to be placed in the conventional level. And Kohlberg actually said that women are unlikely to make it to the post-conventional level because they're too concerned about interpersonal things. So um, a lot of people have looked at, at his test and how it's scored and have said, well, I mean, I think the scoring is the problem. I mean, just because you said something like this happened to my friend does not mean I'm saying, well, I'm worried about what my friend thinks. Um, so some of the problem is probably the scoring. But that interpretation at the end that Kohlberg made, that women can't really behave as morally as men. I'll just let that sit with you while I switch to the next slide. All right, the last thing I want to say on cognitive development is about intelligence. Um, cognitive psychologists are very interested in how a person uses their cognitions, right? There are two ways to study how intelligence changes over our lifespan. You can do the cross-sectional method, which is where you test different people who are currently different ages. So I get a group of people together who are 20, a group of people who are 30, a different group of people who are 40, and so on, and compare their scores and assume that, you know, any differences between the group are um, age-related, that those are aging differences. With the longitudinal method, I follow individuals across their lifespan as they age and draw conclusions from that. All right. So let's look at my little chart of actual data. So let's talk about the cross-sectional method first. So you see along the x-axis that they tested people at 25, 32, 37, every seven years until they got to 81. But what they did was they had different groups of people. So they had a group of 25-year-olds, a group of 32-year-olds, a group of 39-year-olds, and so on, up to a group of 81-year-olds. And they administered, in this case, we're looking at their reasoning ability subtest off the um, intelligence test. And we see that the 25-year-olds 20 year scored about 60 on the scale, and the 81-year-olds scored about 37. And it's just a ski slope down from the age of 25 to age of 81, you are just declining across the lifespan. So we're supposed to infer that the differences are due to age, so that someday when those 25-year-olds who are scoring so well are 81, that they're going to score like those 81-year-olds. One of the problems with this kind of design is that those 25-year-olds are not necessarily equivalent to those 81-year-olds. And when we're doing a test of reasoning ability, um, maybe the 25-year-olds have you know, recently been in high school and college and doing the kinds of questions that you see on a reasoning test. And the 81-year-olds haven't seen those kind of things in a long time, probably since they retired, maybe since they were in school. Maybe they don't have as much school as the 25-year-olds had, and so they didn't get as elaborate training in reasoning. Right? There's a number of things. Maybe their health is interfering with their cognitions. I mean, there are a lot of different things that could cause those 81-year-olds to score differently from these 25-year-olds that have nothing to do with aging but have to do with differences between the groups. It's called the cohort effect the cohorts may be significantly different from one another. Now, the longitudinal method is the way to solve this problem, right? You follow the same individual across their lifespan, and so you start when they're 25, test them again when they're 32, again when they're 39, and so on until they're 81 in this chart. And you get this green bar when you do that method. So you see this nice, stable, you know, actually intelligence is increasing until basically retirement. And then it does decline a little bit, but it barely gets lower than it had been at 25. So it seems like intelligence increases or stays stable across the lifespan for an individual. The problem with this method is that, first off, it takes forever. So I mean, look at literally 60 years to get this data. Um, so most researchers don't have the wherewithal to do it. There's a really long-term ongoing study called the Seattle Longitudinal Study of Intelligence, and that's where this data comes from. They've been studying people since the 1930s. And, of course, the researchers have died, and its grad students have died, and and their grad students are now running it, and it's you know a very long generational study. 
takes a lot of money, takes a lot of time to do it. But there's also other problems, like, for example, um, you know, probably the people who have been doing the best on the test overall are the ones who keep returning because it's not very punishing to go take a test that you know you're doing well on. Um, the fact that they take the same basic kind of test every seven years might allow them to practice and to do better than they would if they took it when they were 25 and then took it again when they were 81. Maybe we'd see a bigger drop because they've forgotten how to take these kinds of tests. Uh, a bunch of different things. So, I mean, both of the cross-sectional and the longitudinal methods have problems. Um, I'm choosing to put all my eggs in the longitudinal basket and assume that stability is probably the more likely pattern of um, change over the lifespan. I'm going to assume that you know your level of intelligence is pretty consistent, I hope. Fingers crossed. And then the last thing I wanted to say about an intelligence is that there are two different kinds of intelligence that we can measure. There's fluid intelligence, which is your ability to reason quickly and uh, about things that maybe you've never seen before. And that's um, illustrated here in the blue section of the chart. And then there's crystallized intelligence, which is your ability to, you know, retrieve accumulated knowledge, you know, information about the world, names of things, you know, locations, geography, that kind of stuff. So you'll notice reasoning quickly peaks in early adulthood and slowly declines across the adult lifespan. And quickly is probably the biggest problem. Um, reaction time slows as we age. And so access to information and things like that can be impacted by our reaction times changing. So uh, we do see declines in fluid intelligence, but you know we, we don't get much below where we are at our peak. I mean, it's not a dramatic loss. Accumulated knowledge, on the other hand, that increases entire lifespan. So, you know, older people like to play things like Jeopardy and other kinds of games that require um, kind of archaic information, but they've accumulated that over their lifespan. And if you ask them, where did you get that? They're like, I don't, I don't know. I just, I must have read it somewhere because they don't even know where they got it. Um, so, but being able to produce it quickly is oftentimes the problem. So don't forget that there are different kinds of intelligence. And uh, so when we talk about you know, changes across the lifespan. It depends on what kind of intelligence you're talking about. Um, all right. And I'll end with a little bit of a biological um, comment that relates to intelligence, which is dementia. You know, a lot of us are very worried that in old age we would develop dementia. This chart is from a scientific paper. That's why it looks so sketchy. <laughs> um, but it's showing along the um, x-axis age, and then along the y-axis, it's showing the prevalence of any kind of dementia. Dementia includes Alzheimer's disease, the big, the most feared one, because it's a pro progressive type of dementia. And it also includes multi-infarct dementia, and things are, are very acute and don't progress. So it includes all kinds of dementia. What you'll notice is until about age 65, the, the prevalence rate is barely above zero. And then it slowly starts to lift off the floor. By age 70, we're looking at maybe 2% of people have some kind of dementia. Um, it isn't until about age 75 that we start to see about 2% of people having severe dementia. Um, we see slightly different numbers for women versus men. Like women are more likely to get it younger, but older men are more likely to have it than older women. Um, so by the time that we're um, into 95 years of age, about 40% of people have some kind of dementia. And so um, it's a lot later in life than a lot of people think, and um, it's not necessarily the severe types. It's, you know, forgetfulness or um, impacts on mood or other kinds of things that you probably aren't thinking when you think about, you know, possible dementia in old age. So that's my little attempt to reassure us about the, you know, the preservation of our cognitions as we age. All right. So I um, forgot I had a little picture about how we're starting to get better at identifying Alzheimer's disease, but it's still not, it's not very easy one to diagnose. It's um, confirmed after death. It's not, we think you have Alzheimer's, and then after death we can say, oh, yeah, they definitely had Alzheimer's. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to, to identify it earlier. All right, so I will join you back here next time to talk about social psychology, or social development.